right <laughs> okay i will um now we mute. yep mute uh, and i think i'll now hand over to tony to um talk about euclid and friends and i'll mute myself so what i thought i'd do would be just basically uh start from um day one and just do things chronologically um as i remember them um and uh just sort of give the background and how i kind of even got to doing this stuff at all um so i'm of the same era as you know, a number of people here i suspect the where the only thing i ever got to do at school to do with um computers was uh, actually push those little holes through punch cards and then send the deck off to um, Imperial College uh, was because it was pretty much the only computer on the planet. Um, I, when I got to university, there was also not a lot of stuff around. Um, uh, I did do a small part of um, a sort of computing bit to my maths degree um, uh, on a PDP-11, um, which is about my only other, sec that was my sort of second uh, uh, encounter of a, of a computer of any sort um, and uh, I actually did go to college with a couple of people who will turn up in the story again and possibly um, there's Simon Payton Jones who you may have heard of who does uh, Haskell he was in my year at, at college and a guy called Paul Chapman who um, uh, wrote a very 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 tiny uh, version of APL which uh, you may or may not have heard of. It's a very strange, esoteric, um, uh, uh, mathematically based programming language, um, which uh, was really only designed originally as a sort of design tool, but they did turn it into a language. And he used to impress us when we did stuff on the PDP-11 at, at uh, college. Um, he'd impress us by just writing three symbols on a on a, on a single line, which would do exactly the same as the, as the, as the 30,000 characters which we just typed in. So um, uh, anyway, uh, so they were the sort of people I knew at the time. But I, did, I actually, a lot of people did actually skip off the course for maths and uh, did uh, computer science, but I wasn't actually tempted to do that. Um, and when I got to the end of the course, uh, I found I was, wasn't actually good enough to be a mathematician. Uh, so. Um, I had to sort of kind of think again. Um, so as uh, the default mode from uh, this sort of position is uh, is to become a teacher, which I duly did. Uh, and I taught at Hills Road Sixth Form College in Cambridge, uh, teaching uh, A-level maths and scholarship maths and stuff like that. Uh, and then of course, uh, a weird thing happened. Uh, some small company in Cambridge, which was quite close at the time because Hillsborough Football College is in Cambridge, um, uh, came up with uh, the BBC Micro. And uh, being the mathematician, in, or one of the mathematicians in the college, uh, everyone sort of said, oh, well, you're a mathematician, you can do that, can't you? Um, so, uh, uh, of course, <laughs> nobody knew anything about doing anything with computers and had to just learn it on the job. Um, and but it was actually a lot of fun, uh, and we did um, interesting stuff with the kids who were all very quite keen on it. Um, and um, so um, we learned um, BBC Basic naturally, uh, but because you could with them be with the BBC Micro, you could actually get the blooming lid off and actually see on the inside what the hell was going on. Uh, between me and the students, we worked out how to use uh, machine code. My first, pretty much my first pro, um, bit of sort of uh, quality programming in, 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 with a Q, with a K rather, um, uh, was a, an interrupt driven uh, driver for a, a 110 board teletype, <laughs> uh, which um, which actually, well, it, the first time we tried using it, um, a, stu a student in the college actually um, produced a little bit of hardware to drive the, um, the thing, um, which was uh, quite a, quite a beast to drive from a from a BBC Micro. Um, uh, and the first time, of course, it just turned, came out as gobbledygook until I worked out that I'd done a 
arithmetical shift left it should have been arithmetical shift right and it, it worked second time which was I, I was really quite proud of um, um, we had a, a kid in the, the school who um, worked for the Cambridge computer store and seemed to manage to get all the games that were actually available uh, in fact the the thing we did most frequently was actually resolder uh, the undersides of the return key from people playing defender the entire time um, <laughs> which would uh, tend to break uh, and we also wrote because the I mean, schools are still uh, underfunded uh, we couldn't afford the official uh, networking uh, system for uh, Acorn i.e. Econet uh, so I actually wrote uh, with uh, again with the help of the guy who did the little bits of hardware um, uh, a <laughs> our own homebrew network system which worked through the RS-232 port um, and use the star motor command to uh, open and close the wires so that the um, signals actually went round the room one way to the hard drive and they came back on the other side. And uh, by turning the, star, the, the motor command on and off, you could break the wire at the, at the two places that you required to get the signals to go round right. It was, uh, and it had collision detection on whether or not uh, two people had actually tried getting to the uh, hard drive at the same time. And this, and we actually burnt it onto EEPROMs, um, and um, somewhere uh, I've, I've still got them. I don't suppose they, they would still work, but they might. Um, uh, so yeah, we did some quite um, extraordinary things. If uh, looking back, in terms of uh, <laughs> the uh, sheer audacity of attempting them in in the, in those days. Um, so. Anyway, so I, I talked for a while, so a few years, uh, and I got to a point where, which I probably a lot of people get to when they teach, uh, where I was walking into the classroom and not, couldn't remember whether I actually taught the thing the day before or the year before. Um, so <laughs> I was getting perhaps a, a little uh, bored with it. And one of my kids was actually, uh, <laughs> put his hand up at some point, uh, he was actually painting the front door of the managing director of a company in the science park um, and had been asked um, do you know anyone who programs? And he said, well, or rather he asked the kid, do you, do you program? And he said, no, I don't, but my teacher does. <laughs> so I got uh, seduced away from teaching uh, by a small company in the science park called Computer One, uh, which you probably won't have heard of either. Um, their specialism, uh, well, again, we did some quite interesting stuff. We did um, stuff on a Amstrad uh, uh, 8256. Um, I wrote a spelling checker for that. Um, a friend of mine actually typed an entire dictionary in <laughs> by just copying it um, uh, into uh, which which was actually used in that. Um, and uh, one of the machines that came out during the time that I was there was the QL, um, which was a 68,000 based uh, machine, um, and uh, I wrote stuff for that as well. So I, I started uh, writing, uh, well, the, the interest that the company actually had was actually in languages. They were actually, they sold a, a version of Pascal for um, a QL. Uh, and I was uh, quite into doing machine code, machine code sort of stuff. So I produced a, an, an assembler and a disassembler uh, and a tracing system uh, for the 68,000. And uh, I don't know quite how it actually came about, but um, we then got some interest or the, the managing director of the company got some interest from ICL, which was at the time the biggest company in uh, the UK for um, and, uh, sort of like the IBM of uh, the UK at the time. And they produced a thing called the One Per Desk. Uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of that, uh, <laughs> which is actually, inside it is actually a QL um, and the uh, device works with um, similar technology. Uh, there's these things which are called uh, micro drives and they've got a uh, infinitely long, well, apparently, piece of uh, tape inside, whoops, uh, with the camera, uh, inside here. Uh, it's actually done as a, as a, as a continuous loop that, that comes back on itself. So it's actually, um, it can spin forever. Uh, ICL actually re-engineered um, these because they found that if they, did let, if they left them on for too long, the, um, the spindles inside actually would burn out. 
So they actually re-engineered them and actually made them slightly better. And this was actually the distribution mechanism for, for, for their software. And uh, the one per desk was actually an interesting machine. And it, it was actually sort of uh, a precursor of internet stuff, really. It had a telephone in it. Um, it was actually a telephone device. Um, it had uh, uh, good networking uh, capabilities as well. And um, after, the, um, after we'd started doing this, so I did the uh, assembler and monitor for them. Uh, and then they were also interested because they were doing stuff with people in America uh, in a basic uh, compiler was actually what they needed. So I started working on that as well. Um, and uh, I used to actually send the, the resulting images over to America. Um, I I'd, I'd, I'd actually transmit them uh, over an international network uh, across the Atlantic, which was quite, Quite a, quite a, quite something in that, in in those times. So this this sort of era we're in about here is a sort of um, uh, early eighties uh, to to mid eighties um, was this, when they were doing this stuff. Uh, in fact, yeah, they they also were into things like parallel machines. So um, uh, oh, actually, I'll come on to that in just a moment. Um, the um, the thing that went slightly wrong with all this was that the the company I was working for <laughs> then went bust. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, they, ICL, of course, would, would, did actually want the products finished. Um, so they re-employed me as a, uh, a teleworker, which again was actually quite avant-garde. Uh, they actually work, wrote a book called, um, the, uh, called Teleworking. Uh, which was uh, about having people work at home, which is actually uh, interesting now. <laughs> I sus yeah, suspect there's a number of people here who, who are now working from home when they weren't before. Um, they actually had it so that uh, the whole point of uh, allowing teleworking for ICL was that they had uh, women who used to, who, who would leave the company and, and have a family. And they were trying to ensure that they would actually come back to the company and actually be able to work for them. So they allowed them to work from home uh, during um, you know, pregnancy and, and raising small kids. Uh, and I joined that part of the company uh, on the recommendation of the person who I was dealing with in ICO. And I was one of their token men. So uh, there, was, there were four men and 120 women in this part of the uh, company. Um, uh, and we would do some quite interesting stuff again. They, uh, they would deliver the occasional uh, machine, uh, washing machine sized computer to my house, which would probably have, it was actually, uh, I actually had a parallel machine uh, with about six boards in it with parallel processing going on, <laughs> um, which you know, we still have trouble with these days. <laughs> so uh, they were quite, um, quite a, a decent company to work for. Uh, by the way, um, if you want to interrupt me uh, during this, by all means, just turn your microphone on and ask questions or uh, or um, get me to elaborate or because I just talking to myself here is going to get. <laughs> and it's, it's sort well, of, I was just going to ask, what year was that? You were saying the parallel machine, Do you know, roughly. Uh, what so that was uh, sort of 83, 4, something like that. Wow, yeah. Um, and yeah, it was a big device and uh, they had to come with a lorry uh, <laughs> to, to deliver that one to my little two up, two down in Cambridge. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Surprised you had the power supply to run it because it was sort of yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I think there was. I think I had another thing that hummed that was on the floor. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> um, oh yes. So yeah. So they, yeah, they they did write this book called the the, the telecommuters about the experience of actually um, and it, with advice on how to do telecommuting stuff. And interestingly, I noticed I had a look for it today, and people. Uh, uh, in the comments are actually saying how, you know, it's actually a rather relevant uh, time now. It cost, cost you quite a bit because there's only about six of them left <laughs> on the planet. Um, right. Um, so, uh, now, because I worked from home, um, I did, I could actually do my own interests and stuff. And uh, going back a bit from th to the college days uh, where I uh, I knew this chap called uh, Paul Chapman, who wrote the 
um, who had an interest in APL. It turned out that in actual fact, he, he also uh, managed to produce, uh, APL was a language which is, is based on very large matrices and uh, so a lot of grunt work. And in, typically in when it first came out uh, in the, I think the book uh, called A Programming Language, which is uh, by a guy called Ke Kenneth Iverson, um, uh, uh, was in 19, it was 1962, and I think they turned it into a language in the sort of late 60s, early 70s. And um, typically, it rang on very big um, uh, mainframe computers because because of the amount of grunt you actually needed. Uh, but Paul uh, Chapman, uh, who was also responsible for the basic that ran on the uh, kit computer called the NASCOM One. Um, he uh, managed to squeeze the entire thing into a small enough space and make it runnable on a BBC Micro. Uh, and I actually wrote, he, he did it with a, 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 a virtual machine language, a bit like Java runs then, uh, which he invented. Uh, and uh, I did the port onto the BBC Micro of uh, the interpreter for that virtual machine. And while I was working for ICL, somehow Paul Chapman and his cronies managed to borrow uh, this strange ARM-based machine um, from uh, Acorn, uh, the Archimedes. Uh, and well, it wasn't though, it was an A305 is actually what they, uh, uh, actually, I think it was a 310 they actually managed to borrow. But they only managed to borrow it literally for one weekend. Uh, so, uh, and I was commissioned <laughs> in the weekend. Uh, could you port the uh, thing you did for the BBC Micro again to this machine? And so I got the machine. I uh, uh, got some documentation on how it worked and all the rest of it. And I was thinking, oh, this is rather familiar, isn't it? This is uh, BBC Micro. Uh, stuff the uh, the operating system is virtually identical the way you you've got bbc basic here it was it looks like bbc basic you've got the assembler well that that looks pretty much the same so i had to i had to buy a book on the uh, assembler which i uh, i can remember actually sitting in icl <laughs> uh, sneakily using their telephones to uh, ring up for the uh, assembly manual that someone had actually fortunately written on uh, on uh, arm um I got that on the. I, I think I, I uh, ordered that on the on the Thursday. Arrived on the Friday. I read it on the Friday, uh, and into the evening. I got the machine on the Saturday. I then ported uh, the <laughs> the interpreter on the Sunday, uh, and gave the machine back. And then on the Monday morning, I thought, blimey, that's a really good machine. <laughs> I think I might go and get one of them. So I went to the um, Cambridge Computer Store and I bought the three hundred fifth. 305 and uh, uh, bought it home and I started playing with it and I was, it was just a case of uh, well what the hell do I do with this this, this, uh, this is so fast um, an incredible bit of kit and look at the amount of memory I've got 135k free ye gods what am I going to do with all of that <laughs> um, I normally like you know 20k <laughs> Uh, I do, I do squeeze stuff into that, but 135k, what on earth can I do with that? And so that was the thing that made me decide, well, I'll do some 3D stuff. Actually, I, I'm going back a little smidge. Um, uh, I had got an interest in 3D stuff kind of already. Um, uh, my father actually died just before I was born. And uh, the, only thing I, the only things I had of his were some books on uh, a bookshelf that he'd actually built. And it was this all kicking around in my house when I was little. And one of the books he had was this one, which is uh, actually uh, how you, you art a drawing board. You actually do um, drawings in 3D and it's got all stuff about vanishing points and uh, uh, interesting stuff about how you you work out where to put things and how you measure the distances of stuff. Uh, and I used this book in actual fact uh, while I was at college uh, to produce a mural uh, of my college room, which uh, was actually a reflection of the room, which we then 
put on the end wall uh, and I, I play with the actual content of the thing so it actually looked a bit more interesting but you could sit in the middle of the room and actually just see a 3D reflection of the room itself which was painted by some of my friends. Um, so that's, that's probably where my interest in 3D came in. Uh, and so I thought, well, yeah, and also I did also do, while I was at college, I did a, a little experimental 3D thing for the chemistry department. So I actually did some spheres that were, which are quite easy to do in 3D really, because you only need to know the, the distances between the centers um, as to whether they're actually intersecting, you know, which one's going to be at the front. Um, so I did, um, I did some stuff there as well. So and 3D seemed like a, a good thing to tackle in terms of, yeah, it's good. this is going to be a little bit tricky. Uh, it uses my maths brain um, and uh, I could perhaps do something quite interesting with that. So uh, I started um, looking around for a little bit more detail and came across uh, this book, um, which has got lots of algorithms for doing uh, 3D stuff. Um, it was it was the sort of recommended um, bible on how to um, do uh, graphics. Interestingly, I think uh, there were actually <laughs> bits inside here. If you actually hunt around, that by Ed Catmull, who is the head of Pixar, uh, who actually designed some of the algorithms which actually are used in 3D stuff. Um, and um, so I went through this book quite carefully, uh, trying to find decent ways of actually uh, doing 3D. Uh, graphics. The one I actually uh, landed up um, uh, um, thinking was probably quite a good bet on the device that I've actually got was known as a scanline algorithm. Um, the scanline algorithm basically works by taking all the surfaces that you've actually got and um, it literally goes ac across the, the line of the screen trying to find uh, which planes are actually um, going to be uh, uh, visible at, at any point. And then you actually work out the depths of the two end points of the thing that you can actually cut with the, the, the plane that is where your, your line of sight is on that particular line. And then if you get two of them overlapping, uh, you then compare the ends in a sort of reasonably sim 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 simple way. And uh, you can then determine which of those two things is actually in front. And not only that, you, you can also work out whether they're actually crossing at that point. So you can do a little bit more effort to work out where the intersection is. And hence, you could actually have intersecting things, which are a lot of um, 3D graphics programs at the time that I actually started writing this couldn't handle. Um, they would actually do um, you know, depth first sort of sorting of, of um of planes, but they didn't. They couldn't actually do an intersection between two planes, which I thought was quite, you know, a bit daft. Really, you could actually do it using this this technique. So I, I made sure that you could actually just push an object through another object, and you'd still see the correct um, result. Um, the code for that then was um, written in pure ARM assembly, uh, and the rest of the stuff I actually wrote in BBC Basic. Um, and the original version of uh, Euclid was actually really, I'd actually really written something for programmers. I didn't think of it as a, as a so this is the, the first manual. Um, I didn't think of it as a, as a thing for, um, uh, for people to use. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, if you actually look through this, it's actually all the technical details on how to use the the uh, machine, the the, the 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 module that I've written um, for you to enable you to do three dimensional graphics programmatically yourself and, and actually get them onto the screen. Um, and kind of as an afterthought, I wrote an example of a program which did that, which was a sort of a front end for, for Euclid. So the whole thing in some of ways in my head was actually kind of back to front. I was thinking more in terms of writing something for programmers not uh, and for me to use, uh, but not for end users at all. Um, but uh, so anyway, so I, I wrote this thing, I did kind of document it. Uh, 
Um, it was on, you know, in a few text files I actually produced and uh, I, I tart it up a little bit just to, to get it right. Uh, and um, Acorn were actually having a, um, their usual sort of uh, conferency type things or, 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 or display uh, in London at the Royal Halt of Cultural Halls. I don't know if anyone went to those ones. And they were basically like an extremely large Victorian toilet um, with tiles all over the walls. Uh, and I kind of, I, I mean, in some respects, I'd only really written the program so far, largely just for my own enjoyment. But I sidled up to one of their salespeople and said, look, I've got this program um, that I've written. You know, you might you be interested? And they pretty much bit my arm off. Um, because uh, nobody written any ruddy programs for, for the Archimedes by then. Um, so they were rather desperate for people to come up and sidle up to them and say, so uh, Sue Wall, who was sort of uh, uh, in charge of kind of getting software houses together, um, immediate, pretty well immediately uh, photocopied my manual and then started telling everybody about it, which was great. So that's how it kind of got there in the first place. Now, um, um, if I missed anything out here, I don't think I have. Um, you, you might want to see uh, as well. Um, I don't know if this is the best one. Uh, no, that's not it. <laughs> Talk about yourself for a minute. <laughs> These are some of the notebooks I actually have. I've got. I've got something like from all the projects that I've actually done over time, I've got about 15 of these things uh, where I would work, try and work out um, how to do uh, various things. Um, they get quite detailed. There are sort of pages of um, masses of amounts of uh, thinking actually involved in trying to work out how to do various things. Um, somewhere in one of these is actually a, a quite a good diagram. I should have actually bookmarked it, which I didn't, unfortunately, because I'm stupid, um, on, uh, uh, on the scanline thing. Uh, I think this one just then. Uh, uh, oh. No, I'm gonna be lucky. I, I just as I flicked this one, I saw some pictures that were clearly are clarity things. Um, but yeah, so there, there's some diagrams there about um, rays going through things and stuff like that. Um, so uh, most of my work was done uh, actually uh, physically on in books. I didn't and uh, trying to work out all the equations and trying to work out how you actually uh, got the thing to to work uh, properly. Um, the other thing I'd sort of accidentally done, I suppose, in many respects, is that I'd actually done everything properly um, in that I'd actually written a proper module for, for uh, you know, with a, with a, and, and I got allocated a proper SWI number for the Euclid module, um, which was, uh, again, something which people weren't doing in the early stages of, of, uh, of writing software for, for the ACORN. So, I was quite deemed quite a good buy for that reason as well. Um, okay, so then what? How how did things develop after that? Uh, am I boring anyone yet? <laughs> uh, no, that's fine. Carry on. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, um, right. Oh, are we? Excellent. All right. Um, so um, now, uh, Acorn. Um, invited me then to one of their shows uh, or rather it was probably one of the pretty much the first show where they showed uh, the Archimedes off to the public um, they weren't too sure of me as a software house I don't think I didn't, obviously didn't have, have a, a standardized product so they put me on a desk which was sort of slightly hidden away from everyone else um, so I didn't get a lot of footfall um, but um, uh, I uh, I was there with other people that you will probably know of, like Colton Software um, and uh, Software Solutions and Oak Solutions and people like that. Uh, and um, Computer Concepts were there. Um, 
so we each had a oh and of course uh mike beecher from um uh whatever his name uh the music thing that he did um who was famous incidentally for um being able to reset a uh a, an archimedes whilst still talking uh because the program had actually crashed and getting back to the same point in his um demonstration just to continue as if nothing had happened <laughs> which was which was uh, quite quite an art um so um this was quite a uh, an interesting place to have uh to be sort of thrown in um they uh you know acorn at the time didn't have uh they, they needed the support of the uh the software houses uh because there was no software uh, so they you know invited you freely to to, to join in and and actually uh, and of course that did help with things like sales um i think i learned actually at those things <laughs> as a consequence all the sort of businessy stuff which i of course was uh, also quite unaware of like the fact that there was actually a sort of a distribution channel for software so uh, most of the time you didn't land up with the amount of money you decided just to, to charge for your software in the first place uh, although charging for software at least was a thing in those days, which was kind of, kind of handy. Um, so um, we met, uh, so I, I met um, salespeople and other software houses um, and, you know, started getting used to the idea that you know, I was all of a sudden starting to, to run a business. And uh, as a consequence, I then, uh, having made a few sales, I then actually, um, well, I actually already had to um, uh, form a company in order to talk to ICL at all. Um, and I chose uh, Ace Computing, which is, this is one of my first um, uh, cards, which I, I also did my note paper the same way. So anybody who got a letter from me typically opened it up upside down um, because there, <laughs> there was the logo on the other end. Um, uh, the AC is in fact my initials, uh, my real initials, which is why, why I actually chose it. Um, it's, uh, so, so it does actually have some connection with me, but I just quite like the idea that it was a card. Uh, and so hence the name of the company. Um, so what happened after that? Uh, uh, my notes run out at this point, <laughs> uh, but I have got a few other things that actually here to, to show off. Um, so, um, from that point, um, the Acorn community actually started uh, getting quite uh, quite strong, and um, Acorn were very very supportive of small software houses, um, and they used to organise um, things out in in the wild where you'd have to go and uh, help out at their at their various venues, um, and you'd get a you know uh, an invite to loads of places all over the country and it, it was actually acorn who also then realized that this was probably not great for the for the the software houses involved in that the it, it, all the small software houses were having to travel vast distances you know so if, if acorn suddenly had a show in glasgow you'd have to make your way up to glasgow uh stand at a trestle table for um uh, for an afternoon and then come back from Glasgow. Um, and as a consequence, they actually invented this uh, notion of actually a, an Acorn Roadshow, which involved putting uh, about uh, between 10 and 20 software houses onto a coach. Uh, they had a, a lorry, which they then uh, put all the kit on. And then you'd do in one week, um, five different venues uh, at five different places around the country uh, and they also paid for uh, the accommodation at the hotels uh, and that way they got a very efficient um, system going of supporting software houses uh, getting roadshows done and not disrupting the uh, the work of the software houses themselves in the process uh, and uh, as I say that the, the chemistry that actually had then happened between uh, people was actually very handy, um, you know, uh, and and not only that, we got quite a community, uh, a, a sort of um, non-aggressive community at that. You know, people would actually help each other out and actually 
form bridges between the companies um, to to um, to make better stuff. So uh, the fact that my software was also used in other people's software, so the module, uh, because it was actually programmable, became something which then people would then landed up putting in their software. So in particular, um, software solutions. Uh, they had a, a product called Genesis, uh, which was a, a hypercard um, sort of kind of clone, but for schools. Um, they put the put 3D pictures into that software by using the Euclid module, which they then um, gave me a, a small you know, a, a license fee for, uh, which meant uh, it was useful to me as well. Um, and um, the thing about these software houses as well was we tended to get um, prior notice because we were considered a sort of a, a closed community. Acorn were very good about letting you know what would happen next. Um, and so uh, what, what was happening next was uh, Risk OS. Uh, so the operating system that we, I originally wrote Euclid on, which the, that original manual I showed you uh, was connected with, was Arthur, which was kind of a last minute, uh, I, I believe in actual fact they did try writing another operating system, but kind of failed. So they basically did a clone of the BBC micro uh, operating system as a consequence. And it was rather sort of thrown together. And um, so having made this uh, version, you, you, it did have a kind of a windowing system, but it was always, if you put it in certain modes, you only got yellow and black as the uh, colors of things, which wasn't right. Um, but my uh, software did actually work in all modes, which was also quite uh, quite odd. Um, um, but we got kind of prior notice that this was going on, that the, the Risk OS was coming, and we'd get early copies of things. Um, so you could actually preempt the market to a degree. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, I, I mentioned software solutions. Software solutions didn't actually exist at this point. Um, that, that was actually spun out by some um, some people within Acorn already knowing before we did uh, that RiskOS was on the way. And they wrote a load of little utility programs that sort of filled some gaps in RiskOS, which they knew they could actually um, they could actually sell on uh, and also produce this, uh, this Genesis thing. Uh, so I was in with that sort of stuff. And as a consequence, it gave me a nice second chance <laughs> to get my pricing right. Um, <laughs> the uh, the slightly calamitous uh, way. I, well, I I, did ch I charged forty five quid for the for a, a Euclid, but by the time uh, the distributor and the dealer had had their cut, it would be about twenty quid, um, which wasn't great for living off. If I didn't make to sell too many, although the, the sales were slowly going up. Um, but second time round, uh, I was able then to to upgrade everything. Uh, which got an upgrade peak through, me, through all my existing customers uh, and also put the price up to 75 quid, uh, which gave me enough cut for um, uh, the, uh, the dealers and distributors. So, um, so we start getting slightly newer versions of things and I'm starting to improve my packaging. Um, in fact, um, Everything kind of slowly improves when you're when you're when you're running a business which sort of slightly grows organically. Uh, although there was a, a point in uh, in the story where my suddenly sort of did a little leap due to a slight mistake. Um, uh, one of the shows that I actually went to, um, so Acorn would have uh, big exhibitions every now and then in in the bigger venues. So they'd go to Earl's Court. And have a, a big stand there, uh, and and uh, Barbican was actually quite a common place where they would actually have uh, shows. Uh, but one particular year, um, uh, I think it, I think it's the same year that they did. Um, they did uh, a show uh, with their stand was actually a large uh, castle that they built. And everybody had her and a heraldic sign that they had over the top of their um, their particular piece of area of the of the stand. Uh, at the time, uh, my uh, I'd actually uh, splashed out on a little bit of um, my own uh, 
kit. I think it was because in that particular case, you, you had to bring your own stuff. They didn't actually supply you with <laughs> anything at all. So I actually bought a pair of trestle tables of my own, which I've still got, uh, and some uh, um, metal chairs with some with, with, with plastic tops, which I've also still got. And that, they're actually in my kitchen at the moment, um, uh, which was my sort of show kit, which would fit in my, uh, my metro. Um, and um, so this particular show uh, was actually in three halls. It was a massive show. Uh, it had three halls involved. Um, there was a games section on, on one end. Uh, there was the really big boys on the other end. So there's IBM and um, Microsoft and um, Ball and all, all those big software houses on, uh, on in, in, the, in another hall. And there was a sort of intermediate hall that they also had for people like uh, Commodore and Acorn and all the that sort of ilk, yeah, Sinclair. All those companies were sort of stuffed in the middle. They weren't quite games companies. They weren't quite serious. Um, so, uh, and they had a, a, a show manual, which uh, also reflected that. So it came in three sections. Uh, there was the big boys, and then there was the people in the middle, and then there was the game section. But they made an error. Um, for some strange reason, that <laughs> they put Ace Computing in with the big boys. <laughs> they actually put me in the wrong section. Uh, I was actually the second on the list after some other kind of ridiculous company that obviously got, managed to get an A, A B rather than AA um, as their first initials. Uh, and uh, so I landed up in the and the big section uh, part of the uh, catalog. And as a consequence, when I got back home, my 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 phone kept ringing from people trying to sell me stuff. Uh, Could we look after your fleet cars? What? <laughs> uh, can we do this for you? Uh, can we can we can we um, copy your discs for you? Oh yeah, oh I, I could do that one. <laughs> yeah, what you mean to say you all make a hundred discs cheaper than I can actually do them myself? Oh, right, okay, yeah, fine, that's fine. Oh, and you'll actually print things on the lay on the on the shutter even. Oh great. Um, and so it went on. So so I actually had a bit of a lucky break, and I was I actually got got so, such good contacts. I was actually supplying them to other software houses. Oh, and one particular one was actually an exhibition kit um, system. Uh, a guy rang me up and said, "Well, well, well we do exhibition gear. Uh, would you would you like you know would you like me to uh, show do a demo?" He obviously thought he was going to come to a, a large company as a consequence of me being in the large company. But he came to my two up, two down, and erected an entire exhibition stand in my front room, which was. If he'd kept going, he had enough stuff to actually make it slightly larger than my uh, my, uh, <laughs> my front room. But I did actually buy some of him. It was brilliant stuff. Uh, and I used that afterwards. Uh, if you actually see pictures in the unit exhibitions, it will be that stuff. It's um, the hexagonal things with the stuff that you actually drop in. Um, so yes, it was a very useful mistake to have been made on, on my behalf. Um, right, what else? Uh, Okay, uh, I'm going back a little bit. Um, um, I, I, I forgot to mention that one of the other things that they did on the road shows was they actually gave people um, prizes every now and then. So they would actually ha have a sort of a competition. Well, Acorn would just choose people that they felt had been particularly good at something or other during the thing, and they give you an award, which I still got. Um, uh, so this is uh, an Acorn Roadshow award. Uh, this is yeah, that is a finial from a staircase, uh, which is the acorn on the top, uh, painted <laughs> thing. And they would do these awards actually in a, in a motorway service station on the way home. Uh, but yeah, I'm very proud of that. Um, um, what else? Uh, so um, perhaps I'll to go, just go through uh, products and other, other little bits of information about them. Um, so uh, Euclid 2, uh, was uh, pretty much the same as Euclid one. I tweaked it a bit. Um, you know, Acorn changed their kits uh, and made things faster. So you've got ARM ones and ARM threes uh, coming along, which always made a, 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 an interesting improvement. And also the operating system was able to do the proper color and all that sort of stuff, which was a great improvement uh, and anti-alias spots and all the rest of it. Um, so most of the products were actually sort of incremental things. Uh, there is one thing that I'm sure someone's going to bring up, so I'm going to bring it up instead. Um, 
I did actually advertise a product called Einstein, if anyone can remember that I did this, anyone? Uh, so I did have this plan to do a, a 4D um, uh, program. And if you look back through the magazines, you'll actually find that I actually did advertise it. Um, it was, uh, I, and I'd started work on it and I was doing, okay, it was the basic idea behind it was actually to mix up Euclid and Mogul, the Mogul being the animation part of uh, the Euclid suite um, and the main part of the thing. So they were actually integrated as a single product. Uh, and I also had some daft ideas about how you could do this in, in proper space time and actually perhaps have uh, a different metric, i.e. you could do a, a minus uh, V squared T squared on the end, end of the thing. Um, and actually then view it from, from different places. Um, and I'd made this, uh, this algorithm uh, based on a fantastic uh, subdivision mechanism to actually uh, to work out where everything was and actually have it so you could do um, you know, Bezier curved um, uh, traveling, whereas uh, in Mogul you can only do basically straight lines between things. It's just the in-betweening rather than uh, uh, the things with acceleration and deceleration and all the rest of it. However, uh, and I did actually do some quite good advertising and stuff, so um, I made a box for it. <laughs> so well, I was getting that sophisticated. I've even got bits of, uh, uh, you're, you, as I say, you will find adverts, but you won't ever find the product because it doesn't, it, it never actually managed to get to market. Because uh, I couldn't get it to go fast enough, so uh, I probably could do nowadays. It's, it was sort of kind of a, a, a particle-based uh, system, uh, but processing that amount of information, uh, despite all my efforts of of, of making it uh, uh, fast and good enough to use, just didn't work. So I had to just sort of abandon it. I just sort of crept out of the rim and nobody really noticed that I'd, or I'd <laughs> abandoned it. Uh, a few people, uh, but I do meet people to this day who, who come up to me and say, oh, you're ever going to do Einstein? There we go. Um, right, uh, I don't know. I think perhaps I, can I just sort of throw the, throw the thing over to questions and stuff like that? Because I, I think I'm probably uh, going to start burbling more than, uh, than talking now. Well, thank you for that, Tony. That was interesting. Brought back some memories to me as well when you mentioned things like the horticultural hall shows because yes. I still live just up the road from there. It's about half a mile that way. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, so I used to go to all of those shows because they were on my doorstep so, as a spotty teenager. <laughs> so who knows? I'm, I might have actually bought tween or something off of you. I don't... Who knows now? Yes, it's possible, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to unmute themselves and have questions or... Other memories? Oh, where do you start? Where do you start? <laughs> do you, I'm quite interested. I don't know where to. I, there's so many questions. You can't think of them right now. But uh, <laughs> do you think you priced Euclid right? How many copies did you reckon you sold of it? Um, I think I sold somewhere in the region of between a thousand and two thousand of them. Um, in actual so it's fact, not it, that many for all the work you no, did, really, it, isn't it? No, no, it, it wasn't my most successful product. Actually, yeah, that, that's one thing I mentioned, what my most successful product was. My most successful product was actually a, a printer driver. Um, so I remember that, yeah. I think <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. yeah so, uh, in actual fact, there's a, there's a bit of a naughty story to go with that as well, in that uh, the printer driver it was actually for the Star LC10. Um, well, the Star LC10 was the first color printer that primary schools could use, and they were really, really pleased with it. And it was basically a, a four ribbons, which lifted up and down, and you could actually hit different colors with the ribbons. And just by leaving the print head where it was, you could actually produce any color you wanted um, with a bit of dithering. Uh, and Acorn did actually produce a uh, printer driver for it, but it didn't work terribly well. It was a bit dark. And a bit, a bit sort of musty, and the colours did, weren't didn't sort of they weren't vibrant. So I they they sent me the codes because they knew I not liked doing sort of low level stuff. Um, they asked whether I could have a little look at it. So I uh, was given the code to have a look at, and basically uh, I discovered that in actual fact they they. Put some gamma correction into the system which is what you're supposed to do it's, it's, it's the right way of doing uh 
uh, color rendering on things like bits of paper, but it turned out that the, ga the gamma correction was just not taking into account the fact that there's an enormous amount of bleed when you're actually using uh, basically a nail and a, and a, and a piece of wet um, ink. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that was the reason why the thing was actually getting too dark. Uh, and they, uh, I don't know quite why, but they allowed me to do alterations to the software and then keep what I'd done. <laughs> um, so uh, I produced a version and all I'd actually done was I took the gamma correction out. I just removed the <laughs> code. <laughs> uh, and uh, as a consequence, people were much happier with the end result. And at a later date, Acorn actually then asked me to sell them back the code. <laughs> so I, I, I got a double whammy of actually selling back the, uh, the, the code they'd given to me in the first place, uh, which was actually the same as code as they'd started with, but with one piece removed. <laughs> And yeah, that, I remember those printers. They were quite something for the time, weren't they? You know, oh, the yeah, yeah, Star LC10s. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Primary schools loved them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, did, sorry, I'm, I don't want to ask you the question. I'll let everyone else ask. But um, <laughs> did, did you, and do you remember, well, you obviously did, but did you use the other packages around the time, like Claire's Illusionist? Did you ever yeah, I mean, well, dabble I, I with that Dave a bit? Because that was quite clever, wasn't it? The way it works. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, Dave Clare was always on on the on the road shows, so we had a mm. sort of a, a, a reasonable rapport with each other. So they, they also came out with Render Blender, which was their their uh, um, uh, ray tracing thing. Almost exactly the same day, I think, as I as I came out with with ArcLight. Uh, we were at the same show together, and they had Render Blender and I and ArcLight on the same show. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 I was very familiar with their stuff. Yeah, he, they, they, they did some really good stuff generally, and he was a really nice chat. Um, uh, Dave Clare's a great guy. Yeah, there were some cracking images done with Illusionist. I remember at the time, but um, yeah. but we I, we, we can all remember it. But I remember going to the Acorn user shows or something and seeing the Euclid animations and the flying birds and that, and just thinking, wow, you know. Well, uh, a lot strange. of that stuff, I, I, yeah. I, the other thing that happened was I, I actually had a, a, a small user group. So I produced discs called Elements Discs. It was um, run by a guy called Nicholas van der Waal, who uh, now runs Astute Graphics, who produces uh, stuff for Photoshop, this sort of Photoshop uh, add-ins. And he's still running to this day. Uh, and he kind of organised it. He, 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 he sort of persuaded me to uh, to collect together things that people had actually done. Uh, so one of the guys that did a lot of stuff was Malcolm Banthorpe, who was a BBC VT editor. And so the, the Flying Birds was one of his. Um, uh, oh, there was, uh, there was also um, uh, the project called The Shadow Project, uh, which was for... Apologies for jumping in there, but... Of people seeing that Malcolm Banthorpe's anime. Oh right, yeah. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Even now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So he and the birds are all the same bird, of course. <laughs> right. Yeah. And who could forget the lamp as well? The Pixar. Yeah. That was another yeah, that, one. When we saw that, we thought, "Wow, we can do Pixar in our own homes." Yeah. Yeah. I think that was someone else. That wasn't Malcolm. That was uh, mm -hmm. Brian. Somebody. I can't remember his, sec his second name. Um, Wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, yeah, the, the, this bit here, I also was going to kind of mention. Do you remember the walking legs? Uh, I can't remember. I don't. I yeah, can't remember those walking, now. There were some walking legs. Oh, so, right. Okay. I remember uh, that. Which were, Goodness me. Oh. Uh, which were actually a physical thing. So, uh, some people called, uh, did a thing called the shadow product. Which was to make some legs, which would actually run. And they had hydraulics that they drove everything with. And this is actually the they actually invented this uh, hydraulically operated muscle, which would actually which would actually um, made a physical model of the thing uh, go. Um, oh right, okay, yeah. Oh, it's all coming back now. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you still have uh, any of these discs, Tony? Like these elements? Yeah, I discs? do. I do have. Them. Uh, uh, most of the discs are around somewhere. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, but how also, interesting! Yeah. Sorry. So I, I, I've 
uh, it's a case that I, I didn't actually come across the elements discs this time. I don't know why, quite why they were probably in a different box somewhere. Um, I should have a complete collection of them. And also I've, I have got source code on, as I say, the corner of a corner of a corner of a disc somewhere, but, uh, but I've just recently moved uh, and everything just got basically scrambled into, <laughs> into a complete mess. So uh, uh, finding stuff just at the moment is actually a bit, uh, uh, a bit tricky so I, I am on it and if you keep nagging at me I'll be oh it's okay it's just uh, <laughs> no, no, you're, it's you're, 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 my, you're my official nagger <laughs> all right well I'm gonna do some more pictures of it because unfortunately a lot of the stuff I did at art college I was the only one working in 3d at fine art college you know right. uh in 1989 in Canterbury and everyone when they saw it was just like wow what yeah. what on earth is this and it's only because of the uh yeah, they had some Amigas there, but uh, I'd got an Archimedes and was doing it all at home, and I was just so bowled over by it all, you know. You could do one thing in your life, and it like, has a ripple effect for somebody else, yeah. and it it, uh, it was amazing, I thought, at the time, you know. Even now when I look at it, like those animations, they still send shivers down the spine of what it was like to first see them, you know. Uh, um, and, you know, Arclight, it... it um, because that's interesting. I mean, was that it's very well ri written sort of program arc like, but was it very, was it very, was that the end? Uh, did that was that coming towards the end when you decided to write arc like, or no, was it... no, so so after arc like, uh, well, arc like was the sort of last of the ace computing specific products in some respects, I think. Um, maybe the well, printer dial probably was actually. Um, I did actually then, I, I then merged with um, Software Solutions, uh, which then also merged with Oak Solutions. And between the three of the companies, we actually became uh, Oak Limited, if you remember. Uh, and then that eventually became Dial Solutions. The reason for that, for the last part of that, is because we found someone with their fingers in the tail. Uh, so we had to fire them and start another company. Um, but, um, so uh, it was partly because, yeah, you know, I was doing everything literally on my own in my front room. So having a, literally having some company was actually uh, quite quite something. Yeah, you know, it was a nice thing to have. So I probably could have kept my company going, doing other stuff, but I I, I didn't. I I decided to merge with them. But I then, then went on to do other similar kinds of stuff. So I did a morphing program. Uh, oh, actually, the, uh, that one, um, that one was actually the result of, uh, I actually, we went for a, a programming uh, weekend, uh, no, programming week away, uh, discussing a product that I thought of, which I couldn't quite get my head around. Um, well, I still can't actually. <laughs> I'm still, still working on this particular project. This is sort of programming based. Um, but um, uh, so we went to the wilds of Scotland, a place called Applecross. Uh, and at the time, uh, yeah, we'd done reasonably well. Uh, uh, Oak, um, I, I don't know if you heard the, the Driscoll brothers. So there's uh, Phil Driscoll, and James Driscoll, and um, uh, who's the other one? Uh, he's left, just left. Uh, sorry, so there's three, there were three brothers on the, from the same family who ran Oak in the first place. Uh, and we all went up on this retreat to uh, to Applecross, which uh, and they were also into into um, old cars. So I had a uh, Mark Ten Jag, uh, and the company owned a, a, a limo. Um, we used to do exhibitions. We actually used to use it as an exhibition stand every now and then, uh, and actually put a computer inside the limo uh, and <laughs> give demos of. Uh, Oak uh, software from from the de from the uh, limo. Uh, the uh, Mark Ten Jag. Uh, we pulled a trailer all the way up to uh, Scotland to Applecross, uh, and we had to take jerry cans with us because its uh, mileage was so poor, and there wasn't actually a, uh, a petrol station at Applecross. And getting back to the uh, to the nearest uh, petrol station and back to the campsite would have actually ran out of petrol doing that. So we had to have jerry cans to take with us. And uh, after discussing the thing we actually went to discuss, uh, 
uh, we used to go to the pub and we worked ourselves through every single whiskey in the uh, in the thing and then we used to come home and then try programming <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and the thing we picked to do was oh, let's do a morphing <laughs> program because uh, um, uh, that Terminator film had just been out where there was a lot of morphing stuff so uh, completely drunk uh, we ma I managed to produce uh, <laughs> the beginnings of a, of a morphing thing and then polished it off and it actually became a product called Reform which was actually sold by, by uh, Oak Solutions uh, later on um, uh, and also I kept going so the, the, uh, the, the last program I probably did write for that platform was called Apollonius uh, which is a 2D uh, CAD system uh, Oak used to produce a thing called Parametric Design Tool which was a parametric um, drawing program um, had about 200 tools on it um, for, uh, but it meant that uh, parametric basically meant that if you made a change to the design that you once you'd done, say you'd done two circles and drawn a tangent across between the two circles, if you change one of the circles, the tangent line would then move uh, to, um, to, to uh, from the change that you'd actually made. So it remembered the co connections between things rather than just being a, a literal drawing program. Uh, and when uh, Risk OS came out, um, well, the late, uh, it, we just, they, they wanted it changed to the new operating system. So I got involved in that, doing that. And I managed to get the thing down to three tools. It's a, it's a very elegant uh, sort of cross between a spreadsheet and a drawing program. Uh, so that was probably the last thing I actually did on that, on that platform. Don't I see. <laughs> and one thing I must get in, I must get it, this in, is why is there no undo on Euclid? <laughs> Because it's hard. Oh, I'm, good at, I'm, I'm good at undo now. Yeah, really, it's really every time. I'm like, yeah, yeah. No, it's funny. It's funny because you put, think about it, you take it for granted now, don't you? Um, yeah. But to write a ray tracer after a 3D program, I mean, that's quite, you're very talented. No. <laughs> yeah. I do um, get a lot of help from books. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it can't be an easy thing. And have you have you tried like VR and stuff now? Have you like uh, again? I'm not I'm not really into that sort of stuff. No, I, I, right. I suppose well, as a company, you know, we we did the the dip that most other companies kind of went through after the that era where unfortunately, well, well, one thing you had to do was kind of go and do internety related stuff. So we all did PHP. Blah and um yeah. stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> it's not uh, fun <laughs> and, uh uh but then of course the era became where you know tons of money were thrown at companies who then give their stuff away for free so actually uh competing against free is actually really quite hard um so um eventually i i but only about three years ago i did actually have to go and get a proper job um, oh right okay yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um and, and now because of the uh, pandemic i'm now working back at home again so i've only ever had uh three years where i've actually had to go into work <laughs> which is fine i see <laughs> are you still programming tony are you still programming yeah yeah so i'm, I'm currently working for a company called linguamatics that do a um a, na a natural language processing system for the pharmaceutical industry uh and it'll search through mega, you know, trillions of, of uh, uh, reports and um, back papers on science-y sort of stuff. Uh, and you can search it uh, in, a, in an intelligent way. I take, it extracts the meaning from them uh, uh, and uh, to hunt for things. So, so it's actually being used quite a lot at the moment because of this COVID-19 stuff. Uh, everyone's searching through stuff, uh, trying to find out how to, how to fix everybody. Uh, so, uh, and I'm doing a new, at the moment, I'm actually sort of spearheading doing a, a new front end for that, uh, using the, because I'm, I'm essentially a front end, so I actually I do back ends as well, um, uh, developer these days. So uh, I do. Right, I see. Yeah. 
I can't believe like Euclid's written in basic a lot of it. It's like a testament to the Archimedes that yeah, it was yes. I mean, you that... done you did that yeah. Well, well, that well, that was down to Roger Strokes, uh, Sophie Wilson, who just wrote a very very efficient uh, interpreter uh, with some very nice tricks in it for for made it work really really well and fast. And there's, there was no point in competing. Well, you know, why would you bother trying to uh, go any yeah you know, for the front end part of the thing? Which is the reason why I did most of my well all of my uh, bits of software. They had a module which was handwritten. So if you took the Morpher for example, the the morphing part of that, the thing that had to do the real thinking and, and fast and to get it to go in real time. Um, so the morphing program just you just put blobs on things and then you put the blobs on another picture and then you'd move the blobs on each one it would do the morph for you uh, so the bit that did the really hard computation was was a module but the, the actual front end i always wrote in bbc basic because it was actually easier to do and you didn't need the speed at that point because you'd already got the speed in the uh, in the in the handwritten bit of uh, machine code i see right yeah I've been trying to get my head, well, I'm not a programmer, but I was looking at how to draw a cube in Euclid or how to try and get into the engine to, right. to, to if it, how easy that would be, you know, to try and draw. It, it was designed like, to be, yeah. reasonably, you just, you just basically gave it lists of coordinates and it would actually work out where to put it. Uh, right. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, and people did, uh, you do, um, did, did actually use it that way so uh um i think that the uh that the angle poise lamp one i think is actually done by programming rather than by uh uh by euclid stuff itself i think that one that was actually done that way i see oh wow amazing well i'll still keep digging into it you know yeah. Well, as I say, keep reminding me, I'll, 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 I am on the hunt for the... All right, not, not uh, the to source, worry. For the source code of more discs, I will... Uh, All right, out well, I'll promise to do some nice pictures with it Thank and you. animations if I can, you know. So, um, it's so interesting listening to your talk tonight, though. Thank you. Shall I let someone else speak? Because I just... <laughs> <laughs> If I can nip in with one on behalf of uh, a younger me. Um, so, Tony, I remember using this software years ago, um, the, uh, the Leeds uh, Education Authority at that time had, uh, were doing like courses for children you know, to teach them how to use these Acon computers. And a lot of what was happening was with the ACE tools, with Euclid and with arc light to a lesser degree um there's been some discussion about source code this evening am i right in thinking that there's some possibility that for instance scanned copies of the manuals or the software itself could be made available yeah, definitely. I, I, i've, I've found the master copies of all the manuals uh, which i will scan in and will get to someone in this group okay. um uh, i did do the one for apollonius at one point i so that's around somewhere too. Right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely that, that bit that job I will get onto sooner or later. Yeah, so you definitely have manuals, yeah. but I will uh, as uh, I will be able to find uh, the the only thing worries me about the source code is that I did have a slightly peculiar mechanism which I'm not sure I can totally remember for sort of I had a kind of a build system which we what you would recognise now as a yeah. as a build system. So. Um, it, it, there, were, there were commands you kind of had to do to get the source code to actually produce the stuff that it was was required. Um, and whether I can remember that bit of it, I, I, I'm not too sure. Uh, I also did things like um, I didn't write literally pure code. I actually did uh, uh, sort of because I was actually used to doing compiler writing. Um, the thing I did mm. for um, for uh, ICL was, was a compiler. So I was kind of used to that sort of stuff anyway, in which case you do register allocation and all that sort of nonsense. Um, uh, so rather than just uh, writing pure ARM code, I had a register allocation mechanism sort of wrapped around it so that it would I could actually read the code rather better. So I knew which register was one, one with each thing. Um, and going back actually a bit, I was going to mention um, one of the reasons why you possibly won't be able to get some of this code working on 32-bit machines, because I happen to know that um, with ArcLight, uh, 
um, Arclight, of course, had to do an awful lot of work, uh, rather next order of magnitude up from uh, from Euclid, uh, but not on the next the next layer up turned out to be Einstein, which is the one I did. Um, but um, there was a point in that that my register allocator literally ran out of registers. Uh, in the central, the, the, the thing I always concentrated on was making the inner of the inner of the inner of the inner loop uh, as fast as possible. That was the most important thing. So, for example, in the uh, scanline algorithm in uh, Euclid, uh, there is actually a, a multiply. And at the time that the uh, chip came out, multiplying uh, two numbers was actually dependent on the number of bits in the one on the right, mm. not the one on the left. I think uh, that, that will well, in one of them, but not the other. So, <clears throat> if you actually look at the central core of Euclid, there's a compare uh, just before the multiply, and it either does the multiply one way round or the other way round to make it faster. Um, uh, and in the case of uh, ArcLight, because I ran out of registers, I actually cheated and kept um, one or two very small structures actually in the flags of the PC, which happened to be the other register. And the bottom 26 bits were um, the actual PC, but the top six bits were the, were the flags. Uh, so I, I actually kept some information in the flags of the PC. So unfortunately, if you did try changing that bit of code, you would have to rethink it because uh, there isn't a, uh, it doesn't translate very well. I think you've just answered why uh, Arclight <laughs> isn't a fan of my risk PC. <laughs> it's a full 32 bit rig. So, yeah, okay. But it is, it is, uh, for, well, um, Reform, I actually managed to track down a copy of that finally after years of searching. Oh, good. And I was surprised to, to actually hear. Uh, but you were responsible for that because it's that yeah. and Apollonius was with a sort of the two oak products that had all this sort of hype about them I'd heard about but yeah I you know I've never seen Apollonius running oh, and it would yeah. be really really nice to actually see what that's capable. yeah again I, I, I that's that's the one product I would actually like to redo uh, again on another platform because it's it was a beautiful piece of uh, stuff um the reason why it's called Apollonius is because um, there's a thing called the Apollonius circle, which actually touches three other circles. And that the code that runs Apollonius, the product, um, actually depends on the solution of just that one thing. Um, and not only that, it's, it, it's rather maniacal about it in that um, everything you see on the screen is only, only uses two pieces of code. Um, so every because uh, uh, normally with geometry programs you have to do lots and lots of different bits of geometry to solve all the things so you're inter intersecting two lines finding uh, finding the uh, a line that goes through two points etc 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 it turns out if you actually think about it for long enough which is what I did um, they're actually all the solutions they're all they're all particular solutions of the uh, Apollonius <laughs> problem so my code actually reflects that there's, a, it, there's actually only one well, two pieces of code in it that drives literally everything that is actually going on on screen, which is why the, also the user, user interface, rather than having uh, something like 30 uh, buttons to click, which you normally get in CAD packages, it's only got three. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I will try and uh, get that. Uh, uh, if I can find a disk and just send it to someone, uh, I'd be happy to do so. Well, it's all part of computing history, this, isn't it, now? You know? <laughs> Yeah, it must yeah. be amazing. Yeah, well, I, I, I didn't know it was at the time. <laughs> no, oh, no, for sure. I mean, it must be amazing, like, you know, like with your internet stuff back then or whatever it was, the remote working and yeah. the Euclid stuff now and seeing what's happened, you know, with computing. It must be quite, well, it's a gradual thing, isn't it? But it's quite amazing, isn't it, to see? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that it, it, there certainly was a point where it didn't go through a particularly good period. I don't, I, I think it's, it's becoming um, better. I, I, I quite like things like, you know, and JavaScript is quite a nice language. It has that same smack as uh, BBC Basic does. It's very direct, and you can you can get on with stuff, and it's pretty efficient. And you know, uh, and it's uh, and again, why would you bother with anything else that's more complicated? Where if you're trying to do the front endy bits of stuff, it's it's a very nice environment to be playing in. 
Um, it's quite nice now that there are people actually getting more interested in doing kind of low level stuff because uh, Moore's law has now stopped. Uh, the only way things are going to get faster again is because people have actually gone in back in and actually started handwriting them, I suspect. So uh, that will be a, a new trend, I'm guessing. I see, yeah. So what, 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 what language do you program in now mainly? Like what's the sort of... Basically JavaScript. I, Is so it I'm right? Okay. Node, node applications. I'm a, um, mm. I'm, uh, I use Vue.js as the uh, front end. So mm -hmm. knows that stuff. Well, it's quite extraordinary, like your, you know, the paths of all the things you did. Uh, you're quite wizzy, really, aren't you? You know, maths and 3D. The way you just say you just picked up like assembly and could just start writing stuff. I mean, there aren't that many people around like you, are there really? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. But I, you know, I distinctly remember the graphic, the Euclid uh, Ace Computing logo. It, it It's very strong that uh, your graphic sense, you know, oh, right, I remember yeah, that I, very well. All the, everything about it. Yeah. Yeah, I did actually bring on some, oh yeah. Yeah, I brought, brought some of the literature along as well. So yeah, that's uh, you can see that I actually improved over time. Oh, so that, that's yes, original, I remember that. Yeah, that, that racing that. car. But I, I got really quite good at it later on. So that's 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 getting better. Oh, very it? nice. Yeah, very, and, and then, of course, yeah. Because because I was doing better over time, I eventually managed to afford colour. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly remember that racing car. Now you have shown it. That was another one. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah really impressive um oh well thanks tony it's been really interesting listening to you well, thank i'll you, have yeah. lo more questions for you down the line i'm sure yeah, by always, I don't want to, uh, yeah thank you <laughs> i'll keep sending you pictures so i can uh you know keep that keep that going yeah it's all time though isn't it it's quite hard you know just having to scan your manuals and go to work and do all of that yeah well appreciate. yeah it's it's actually sort of sifting through all the other junk on it. I also kept along with it. It's finding yeah. the, the good bits within that. <laughs> uh, it's also Can I say, uh, thank you very much, Tony. It's been really interesting. I, I worked for the uh, Leeds Education IT team for three years. And one of my colleagues um, took to Apollonius like a duck to water. And he produced the most fantastic animations of... All right machinery and engines it was just tremendous but thanks for the program brilliant thank you i say it will be interesting brilliant if you do find all the code and get it out again so again sorry it will be very interesting if you do manage to find the discs and the code and things yeah yeah i was well, as I, say, I, say, I, I am on the hunt uh, but as as has just been said it, it's always difficult you have to sort of kind of fit, yeah. fit it in between things and it, as soon as you start with this sort of stuff and you try and find things you find yourself in the loft for about two hours <laughs> <laughs> going yeah. through completely relevant bits of paper and you never quite get to the thing you actually wanted so uh yeah it's, it's, it'll be a, it's a bit of a you know a project but uh, i will get there uh, i love seeing your handwritten notes in those books you know yeah. of your thought processes of all of that yeah. those would probably be like gold dust one day those you know well, if well, not yeah. now but <laughs> but somebody posted a, a euclid menu on the star dot forums recently i've been asking oh, right. for it for ages and oh, right, somebody well, said I oh will, actually I, I will send it uh, I... they did post one on the forum and uh that was great yeah, yeah, yeah. i've even got this one look oh wow what the <laughs> sad it into german <laughs> 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 there's probably someone in germany one person somewhere using the software um, still no <laughs> doubt so um oh i'm glad we could track you down that's been so interesting okay well I, i'll see if i can attend some more of these because they are obviously going to be quite interesting yeah me too i think so as well um they also do the uh, a bug one which is the bbc micro one that uh uh, they've been doing a few of those and they've put the videos up Tony I'll send you the link but on the uh, Centre for Computing History a All lot right. of the presentations and some of them are quite interesting the yeah, programmers I, I did watch a yeah. couple of those uh, right, okay. was doing one, which I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so we'll have to archive you I expect you're a bit oh, of cool. computing <laughs> history aren't you yeah 
Um, all right, I'm not going to say any more now because I've been talking non-stop, but um, thanks again, yeah? Okay. So, yes, anyone else wants to jump in with questions or thoughts on... Anyone else remember using the programs, I suppose, in the past? Yeah, actually, I, I have something to share, guys. Um, hello, everyone, because I'm new. Hello, um, <laughs> Euclid was... Um, I'm Italian, and um, I'm used to use Archimedes from the very beginning. Um, I was used to um, coding for, for computer shops. I was working at the time on Amigas and Ataris. And, and when uh, the company that imported it in Italy uh, started to make advertisement um, on magazines in Italy of the Econ Archimedes, and the possibility for me to have a risk machine in my bedroom, that was super cool and I wanted to try that. And one of the very first programs that they gave me was, I think it was a demo of Euclid, with all the animation. And um, basically the story is this, that the Archimedes came to the, to the, to the shop where I was working at the time. Um, and um, they started to play with it and they, they found out the Euclid uh, stuff and then they started to play it on the window. And it literally captured a lot of people that were passing by that street on that day. And nobody could believe that because even people that use it to uh, use the Amigas, we are talking about the time of the Archimedes 305 was the time of the Amiga 500, which could not even get close to that type of things. Uh, and in Italy, we were a bit late. So probably here you started to have already maybe the, 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 the 400, I don't know. Uh, but um, that was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, it's still a fantastic memory for me uh, of the Archimedes itself, but mostly of Euclid and the animations and, and all the stuff. And the 3D with all the colors that the Archimedes could produce at the time. That was super cool. So thank you very much for that. The presentation <laughs> today was amazing. And, 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 and thank you for you. Thanks. That was one of the places where the Archimedes always used to excel, wasn't it? Compared to its contemporaries, was in 3D because it had the extra processing power. Because you know, the Amiga could throw lots of sprites around, but if you threw 3D at it, it tended to struggle a bit. Well, you had light wave on the Amiga as well, didn't you? But you really had to get a bit more of a yeah. advanced Amiga really to run light wave. Yeah. yeah. The Amiga had the software, so let's let's make it good. They had the software, but yeah, lots of good stuff. <laughs> yeah, but but the the um, the performance were there was day and night, especially between the Amiga five hundred and the A three hundred five or the A three hundred ten. Sorry, the A three hundred ten. The performance difference were absolutely. Uh, you know, the Archimedes was uh, to me is still is the king of the old home computer. And not because we are in a, in a obviously, risk class club. It was. I mean, I coded on the Amiga, I coded on the Atari. Um, the Atari was, for example, much easier to be coded than the Archimedes. It was uh, coding on, on, on the Atari ST was absolutely easy, even if even, you know, everybody could do it. Um, lots of tools, an enormous amount of manuals. Even if you were, had no knowledge of programming on the Atari, you could code. So the Atari, for me, was the easiest one to code on. The Amiga was... It was a it was a console that they transformed into a computer, uh, and it really was. Um, it was a game console that, for two D games, had a lot of hardware features, right? But then, uh, you know, coding those features on ARM uh, made it. Uh, it at least was better, even on gaming. Because, for example, uh, if if everybody wants to, you know, kind of counter prove me. Try Xenon 2 to make a blast on, on any Archimedes ever produced, and then try it on the Amiga, even Amiga 1200. And you will see that at some point, uh, Xenon 2 to make a blast, the game sprites start to slow down a lot on the Amiga, uh, while on the Archimedes just keep going. That game Starfighter on the Archimedes is very impressive, isn't it, for the 3D? Uh, of and, <laughs> yeah, and the dithering and everything, it's like, yeah, Euclid and Starfighter for me are. Yeah, so, so the only question I have, technical test, is, uh, um, you know, I know, I know it's impossible to, it's nearly impossible to have a version of Euclid running on the modern hardware for, for, for Risk OS, but maybe some, some version that actually used the floating point on the A5000. 
Euclid with the 32 bit module works works fantastically. I'm using it on an RMX6 and it whizzes around diagrams which are far bigger than you could ever do on the old machines. Where do you get that module from, Dave? Uh, I'm trying to work it out. Um, I've been looking for it on the web. Somebody uh, just found something that said there was a 32 bit Euclid uh, spied with Easy Writer and Tech Writer. There's no way to show this. Show this oh, Druk. Um, that's the player module. That's the uh, Ace Film Decompressor. Well, I've, yeah. I've certainly got a 32-bit Euclid module in there. I've checked it with, my, and I don't think it's one I ported myself. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, no, I've no, forgotten. Like, oh. Ten years ago, well, more than ten years ago now. When the say. Euclid <laughs> Trinity, no, it's one ten. When, when the um, the Ionics came out, I, I ported lots of stuff. I'll have to check to see if it's one of mine, but. It works. I like think there might be a, a Euclid module which has been translated, as I recall. Yeah. Because <clears throat> it, it wouldn't have been so, quite so difficult with Euclid itself. If you did I, I've been sitting here whizzing around all my old models of, of planes because I did uh, I did lots of different planes like F15, F14, and. All right. Do you want to show us any of them, Dave? Hmm? Do you want to show us any of them? Uh, I could do. Um, <laughs> Give him a share minute, it. he's got to work out how to share it now. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've got a PC which logged onto a Linux, which has then got to split. Ah, okay. Not the same machine. Okay. <laughs> as, as I said, give him a minute. <laughs> um, which screen is it going to be on? Uh, that one. No, still got you. Oh. Uh -huh. So uh, can everybody see the screen now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll hide, I'll, uh, we've got two things up. I'll hide the one on the right because that's top model. That's somebody else. Oh, <laughs> that is so impressive. That's great. So I what? started off on Euclid. Top model came later. Euclid was my, my first one that I did and I absolutely right. loved it. I, I went and drew out all of the, uh, the planes, copied them from a book in draw, and then translated it into uh, Euclid. You can see that lockdown serving Dave really well. <laughs> kind of going through all his old files. Yeah, I've discovered all these again. Oh, those are great. I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> the Harrier. Fantastic. And I made little films of it. Now, I think, Brian, you mentioned that there's a, a copy of projector that doesn't go half height. Well, no, it's just one I just yesterday hacked a scale into just to make it. You could let like me it. it would work brilliant then because um, if I. If I bring one up, you can see that it's only half half the tight of the window. Oh, I think I remember seeing this actually. Yeah, I've got lots of it, films. So it, it, okay. not, just do planes, do Channel Four. Oh yeah. Um, Central TV, if anybody remembers that. Oh yes. These oh wow. Animations mm. need a lot more frames in them because they they were really slow to display before, but they're they're, they're a lot quicker. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've did a film of uh, Harrier taking off and, and uh, landing, but it, it, I have to change into a screen mode, that, which works when you're on a, a monitor, but viewing it through uh, VNC, it would just make screen half the height as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe don't do that then, yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, so I did, I did loads of things on, on Euclid, uh, and then I got top model, uh, and I did much more sophisticated things with that, of course, but it took a lot longer. So I only did a couple of models. And as you can see, that one is rendered. Yeah. If, if I need to keep going I, Euclid to make it do that. <laughs> I notice you've got a VRML folder in your Euclid. Uh, what's that? that? Sorry to go, I don't want to go off topic, but in your Euclid windows, are you mixing yeah, VRML yeah, with yeah, Euclid well, somehow? Well, me. Um, I VRML out. Did you? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> oh, how interesting. I didn't know you could do that. Ah. So I've, like been yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. I've been wondering how to get stuff into Euclid. I mean, there's a DXF uh, importer, isn't there, yeah, where you not can very, import... Not very good. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah. I didn't know you could do VRML, though. I must admit, yeah, that's really that's exciting. <laughs> right, okay. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's occasional hiccup on this. I'm surprised. I mean, I'm really surprised it worked at all. Um, there's, there's the occasional abort on here because it's it's running. It is running on a an Armex six. Well, uh, it probably it probably run 
slightly less crashes on a Ionix, but not as quickly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's there's a few of few of the things that I did with it. We'll unshare now. Where are we? Stop sharing. Yes, it would be good to get all these things together at some point uh, later on. I know everyone do it, you know, like uh, central repository where we can all. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind uploading any of my files if somebody wants to make an area where we can stick things. Yeah, we we'll have to have a think where it, or if Stardot know have a place where we can put things like that. I don't know. Yeah, but um, but yeah, the those are impressive. Of it. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say there's the ongoing discussion on Stardot about the about archiving 32-bit software and 26-bit rather. Oh right, okay. So, mm. it's, as you say, it's a question of finding somewhere to put it all and then curating what we've got. I, I didn't actually show you it working on Euclid. Uh, <laughs> let's try that again. Oh, was that just projector? Maybe playing? Yeah, uh, I can actually load the model in. There's... You can see how small it was when it was saved on that sort of resolution that I had before. Yeah. <laughs> that was full screen back then. <laughs> it's a little bit slow now because it's coming across several different computers. Yeah. It's now VNC in from one machine to another and then out through your Zoom, is it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You've heard of global warming, haven't you? <laughs> But uh, yeah, I can't remember how to use it all now to make it show the rendered version of, of stuff. Um, well, you've got somebody on here who probably does. Yes, I think so. <laughs> 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 yeah. What are you doing uh, I think that's the camera, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah, right click over it. Right click. Over, over the uh, screen somewhere. In the... I can't remember. <laughs> you can't remember. <laughs> hang on, hang on. I, I'll, 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 I'll. <laughs> I think I've just shown the error. I need to go back to the actual. Oh, All right. Every time I see, see that, the that piece of work that took days to create, <laughs> is... that's all right. It's uh, I've, I've double clicked on the arrow rather than the play. I have to say, every time I see those coloured icon icons of Euclid. Yeah. I get that little bit of excitement inside, you know, like it's 1989 again, because like visually it's nice, it is a nice looking, isn't it? Yeah. Sort of. and it, was, it was so easy to use as well, I mean, mm. so the simplicity oh, yeah. of it, that's, that's, that's the key. There's no point in having a program that, you know, first to fantastic in the world if it's got 20,000 buttons and you don't know where yeah. to Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, who's Matt? Uh, <laughs> well, and that's working through Emular, right? <laughs> Sorry, this is working through AEMular, right? So, what's that? Is it working through AEMular? Because I see the AEMular icon. Oh, no, it's not working through AEMular. I had that loaded because I, I loaded up an impression thing. I should be able to quit out of this and show you it's still carrying on going. Impression Publishers running. All right, let's get oh, right. Well, that's super cool, then. Probably crashed now that I've just done that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think uh, yeah. If you I think it's that... gone over two mouse pointers, but uh, yeah, it, it didn't. It doesn't need emulator uh, emulator. It's it's completely um, self-contained. It's just that Euclid module because that's the front end's written in basic. There's nothing to do there. Yeah, I think so that's to reset that now. <laughs> that's the only problem with Whiskers. It does tend to go. A particularly well, running emula as well on top of that yeah. isn't it? Well, I, I just loaded up impression published to show an old, old file and that tends to uh stuff it up a lot have you sorry have you still got your archimedes tony anymore do you just uh, uh i have got it but i don't think it'll work <laughs> oh right okay yeah it's been, uh, uh, it's, been a, it's not been in storage particularly well so right um, okay i wouldn't guess it's going to work yeah. Mm. Probably blow up. <laughs> I've certainly been tempted to buy another one off the eBay or something. Yeah, I haven't yet, but um, just 
Well, they are real nowadays. I mean, the, 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 if you if you talk about the 300 series, they are more common like the 3000, 323, 10 series. Yeah, I want to get my old A310 set up again with Euclid and a floppy disk. <laughs> just got one there. <laughs> I don't think I'm, you even had hard disk ever. It's just floppy disk. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. I'm Not just quite. looking around the room going, check, check. check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, trying yeah. to get those on the shelf as well, because I'm sure I've got them all up there somewhere. It's I the only thing about emulation is, you know, being able to, like, save your stuff to Google Drive or it makes it a lot easier, doesn't it, just being able to back stuff up. But I guess you can do all the... SD card stuff on the Archimedes now, can't you? Like the MMC stuff, and yeah, yeah. it's not a big deal, is it? No, it's, it's might... not actually. Actually, you can uh, with the Z IDFS card, you can mount it. it the 310, 35 works really well with those. Actually, it works faster with the Z IDFS than it does with the SCSI card, if anybody is interested. And then you can connect uh, an SD and bring it out as a floppy on the front with all this new thingy that have like, you know, this flat SD cables, which you can plug in as an SD on the uh, ZF IDFS and then bring it out so you can uh, swap your hard drive with whatever you want on your Archimedes and it will boot fine and everything else. Right. It's tempting. It's tempting to go back to 1989 again. Definitely. It is. I love it. I'm, I'm about <laughs> to do something crazy. I'm about to expand it to eight megabytes of RAM. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm going to get back on Euclid this week. So an arc light. I keep sort of um, having to... Um, I keep running out of memory in ArcLight. I think it's me, though. You have to keep pushing up the memory uh, a bit, well, don't that you? That was probably, yeah, one of the things that would happen. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's quite fast for what it is, though, isn't it, as well? That's the other thing, yeah, that, the rendering that, that speed uses, of it. Uh, it's a thing called a voxel technique. So right. basically subdivides the world into bigger and little, bigger and smaller boxes so that it can very quickly determine whether a ray actually goes through a piece of space and hits something. So uh, you do a thing called a voxel subdivision, um, which makes it into big and small bits that are easy to find. Um, yeah. It sounds very complicated. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. There's, there's <laughs> the display that you get while it's doing the calculation tells you how many you've got. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I can't get my head around what it's like to even start to try and program something. Very impressive like that, numbers but... with lots of note digits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if only we could fit two bits here, because now uh, I've got two gigabytes of memory on the Armex. So, uh, <laughs> it's a lot quicker. So you have to wait weeks for the thing to render, and you can view it in in uh, sixteen million colours with fixed number of pixels. Yeah. So I remember doing ray tracing on my old free as well. I, I left it going day and night. I bedroom so I couldn't sleep <laughs> for the fan noises. And uh, <laughs> and at the end of it, you you know, you come out and you have this little like 640 by 480. <laughs> that, that was a, one of the things that always used to impress me with what people used to produce was, was just the sheer complexity of the stuff that they, they managed to put in. I never, I never expected people to put quite as many facets on stuff that they uh, that they actually landed. I never made models as complex. They always push it as, as yeah, the ones that my that. customers did. It was, it was, I was always dead impressed by the uh, by the effort, and obviously the amount of time you'd have to wait for things like uh, a well, rend you, rendered version. You could always rely on a new computer to go out next year that was quicker. I mean, you know, you had your you yeah. want to. Archimedes, then you had your A5000, and then you had your, you know, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, the, the, and then the, the Wisp PC and the rest of it, and the strong arm. Yeah. Is it, do they, so does it work, does it work on the program work up to like the A5000, is that right? And then it doesn't work past there, or you've got it working, but on your Wisp PCs, is that right? 
The, it should work on the risk PC. Yeah. It, oh right. I re yeah. Uh, sorry, I use the risk PC R PC emulator. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go up to the strong arm risk PC, but after that, no. <laughs> yeah, probably not. And, and as soon as it, they switch the PC from a twenty-six bit thing, you, you're going to run into problems. I see. Right. Um. Uh, was it um, like programming in Risk OS? Was that quite a nice thing to program in as well? You know, from uh, generally, yeah. I mean, it, that it was. It, it was well well made stuff. Um, yeah, so some of the programmers that worked on that in in Acorn were absolutely excellent. So, right. Um, yeah, I I'd, I'd still say it was it's world class in that sense. You know that it's it's reasonably easy. To, it's straightforward to use and very competent at what it does. Um, yeah. 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 Even today, you look back at it, don't you, and think. Um, it's a shame it almost, you know, what happened to it really, wasn't it? From, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah I, I, what came out of Acorn after that point was uh, <laughs> pretty Change impressive. the world, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. Well, um, well um, we better let you go now, I guess, yeah, all of yeah, us, because right. we've all got to be up for work and it's getting <laughs> yeah, quite so dark, yeah. <laughs> but looking like Dracula. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank I'll you for talking. Say, I think I might have to. Thanks. Go. Yeah. yeah, it's been really interesting, Tony. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'll see. You. And we'll all talk yeah. to you soon. All yeah. right. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Right. Bye bye. Thank bye. you, Tony. Thank you very much. Um, sure.